Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for February 7th, 2021, the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. And the texts are Isaiah 40, 21 through 31, Psalm 147, 1 through 11, and 20C, 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 23, and Mark 1, 29 through 39. Ralph, last week you made a uh, reference to um, this current moment as we were looking, uh, I think it was at the Deuteronomy text, uh, and uh, we have a, a real sense of cleanliness or unclean now. Uh, I have to admit that the things that have been going on now and how the crowds have responded um, makes the line uh, in verse uh, 33 stand out for me. The whole town gathered at the door. Uh, and um, I often read those kinds of statements simply as hyperbole. Um, and uh, I read them differently now in our current moment simply because even in the hyperbole, the reality is when the masses gather, that is significant if, as you are accounting for the events around you. And, um, and, and so I, I'm reading all of these lines now in a sense that says, how do we, and this, this goes back to last week's reading of Mark as well, how do we speak in a way that is so astounding that it gathers the crowds. It's that invitational and it's that countercultural. I think that's what this healing moment does. And I just wanted to lean into that uh, because of your recognition of the moment last week. It's interesting that those those details are so easy to fly past in a in a passage like this. And and again that's the reminder that there's something magnetic about Jesus, the way the gospel authors describe him, that he never goes into a town and says, bring me all of your sick. You know, they, they come to him, they find him. And then even at the very end, he seems to be almost kind of evasive. He's right. You know, they, everyone's looking for you. And he says, time to move on. I've got, so this is important for getting a sense of the character of Jesus, but also the character of his ministry and helping people, understand that it's this idea of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom that's his primary um, objective. But that always, of course, involves healing or addressing human need, human brokenness, um, human captivity, whatever that, that might look like in given places. And then he moves on. I mean, it's one way in which you can use this passage and even this very short season of epiphany to start to provoke the question, um, why are they going to kill him at the end? Or how are we going to relate the public ministry parts of the gospel with the story of the passion so that people don't think this is just about a really nice, generous person who got killed by mean people, but so that people have a sense of the ways in which this, this kingdom proclamation and the ways in which the, the setting people free from the forces of death um, are real threats to certain kinds of political institutions and ways of viewing the world. Well, and that and that setting free from death is the is the kind of demonstrative power that's being uh, witnessed in these first two episodes in Mark with the with the driving out of the unclean spirit and now uh, it. it a healing of Simon's mother-in-law with a fever that might not seem like it, but Mark is trying to communicate that of that this is a this uh, this is a restoration from death uh, and or a, a, a potential deathly issue, and because you get the language here in verse thirty-one, so he went to her, he took her hand, uh, and the and the translation. NRSV, I'm assuming, helped her up. Well, it's it's the verb there is a gay row. Rose, she rose, she rose up, uh, which is the uh, direct connection to the resurrection. And so, it's it. This is not this is not just a healing moment. It's a being raised to a kind of life 
uh, a resurrected life, a, a, a new a new life uh, that that is now possible in Jesus. And then that's affirmed by uh, what her response to that. So her response is not just, you know, she made sandwiches for them, made them lunch because they were hungry. That's, that's not the, that's not the issue. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. Well, of course the verb there is, uh, to serve, uh, diakonia and, uh, and which the angels did to Jesus uh, in uh, in the desert. And what Jesus came to do, Jesus will tell his disciples uh, in 1045, 45, I came not to be served, but to serve. And so she's not just restored from this, you know, this sickness, but restored to what discipleship looks like uh, in this gospel. And, uh, and that's, and so it's in, in many respects, her, in many sense, her, her discipleship moment. Uh, and, uh, and then the, also, I think it's important that this connection of service, that uh, this is, this is the, I can this is the kind of identity that disciples have, and that Jesus will make this connection that, that his experience of being served in the wilderness by the presence of God and the angels is then what he takes forward in his ministry and ends up defining his ministry right before his um, entry into Jerusalem in chapter 10, that my, that my, this ministry is about service, but it's about service that, that brings um, life out of death and, uh, and that he himself experienced in the wilderness. And, and now, uh, now Simon's mother-in-law is experiencing in her healing. Uh, and so I, I think making those kinds of connections too with this is, this is not just a healing, but tied into the identity of Jesus, Jesus' authority, and what truly his ministry is all about. So helpful. So helpful, Caroline. Um, are we talking about Mark? Because you're like, you have as much passion as when you're talking about John. It's kind of awesome. <laughs> the, uh, I've been talking about Mark a lot. Like I did a... You? Yeah, I did a preaching workshop on on Mark. It and then shows. Did a Advent thing and did a okay. Advent thing on Mark. So I've been like, I think Mark is uh, the perfect gospel for right now. Absolutely, awesome. I, I totally agree. Yeah, um, I'll talk about that more when we get into Lent. But this was yeah. really, it was really helpful. Um, but the text that we use on our website is not the NRSV. Oh, it's not. Uh, thank you. What is it? Because of, I don't know what it is, but for copyright reasons, we can't use the NRSV. The NRSV oh. has lifted her up and served them. So they get served okay. right. Good. The, uh, the NRSV, I like though, they're just pointing out it's raised, right? It is, yeah. this is this is a foreshadowing of the resurrection mm -hmm. and the serving, um, the serving is discipleship and it's also what she wants to do. Mm -hmm. So it's, this is not menial uh, that um, some, uh, some commentators, unfortunately, as you guys know, my mom uh, just died last month and my mom, big part of my mom's identity was serving hospitality. Mm -hmm. And as she mm -hmm. aged the last few years, she couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so to, to have, uh, to be at their place, especially for a big holiday was really irritating for her because she could not do it but she mm -hmm. still wanted it done her way which then drove my sisters crazy so my brother and I would we don't mind being told what to do uh, we have two older sisters and you know mom so my brother and I then had to take over the kitchen uh, because we would do it just like mom wanted it done right uh, I, but I raised that up just to point out is this is not um, this is a very positive thing she is restored to her vocation Mm -hmm. in life but uh, she's almost died and again I just she's in bed with a fever and you know I remember those last days uh, when mom could no longer get up and then finally could no longer talk and uh, to be raised up from death and restored to vocation and relationship and discipleship that's a big deal mm -hmm. so notice the first two people that Jesus then um, heals are uh, right this uh, last week demon-possessed man, 
uh, in the synagogue. And the same day after they leave the synagogue to go home and conti uh, they're continuing to keep the Sabbath. You know that because it, in the next verse, it says that evening after sunset, the Jewish day ends at sunset and the new day starts. So as it wasn't then. So notice the people are keeping Sabbath. They don't bring people to, to Jesus to be healed until after the Sabbath's over. Mm -hmm. detailed that's not really important to your sermon probably uh but uh so on this first sabbath the demon possessed man and the fever ridden woman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think that's uh that's an important point rolf that it that that she's she's restored to her vocation of what she was then unable to do and uh and 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 at the same time a vocation that is directly tied to jesus own uh, and so that's that's the power in this healing as well is that that it, it's a it's a, a direct connection to as we've been talking about already uh, what does what does it mean to uh, what does it mean to participate in in this uh, work of the kingdom of God of God being loose in the world and and sir, and this is one of the essential embodiments of that so yeah really important. It's not about what I get, but my response because I have received. Mm -hmm. All right. Matt, Anything we're else? waiting for you to jump in. Anything? About this? I I think I've said all I all I need to say here. All right. About Simon's mother in law. I could say when I was in the Holy Land, I've seen her house. Me too. I know. I did it too. There you go. I've seen her house too. Yeah. I, picture, I can imagine just where she's lying too. And uh... <laughs> well, and you know those those homes, right? I mean, these are these are extended homes. You know, series of rooms with narrow streets. And I mean, if the whole town is there, mm -hmm. only talking about five hundred to a thousand people, but there's not a whole lot of room on those no. on those streets, those passageways. I mean, we're talking about. Mm -hmm. you know um so it doesn't take about a, a spectacle yeah, exactly it doesn't take a lot for it to feel overwhelming spectacle i like that word matt you know I, uh what you were saying earlier Joe, just to remind me like you said uh the whole town was gathered at the door you took that as some sort of hyperbole but think about uh if if here's if in your small town the news goes out hey they're giving out the vaccine in the grocery store parking lot. And that's happening uh, literally in some places, right. uh, Florida. And then the line, There's the whole a... town shows up to shows get the up. vaccine. Yes. And, and now what, what Jesus offers, of course, is the kingdom of God, right? Go back, wrap your mind around this. God, yeah. Jesus offers the kingdom of God, the good news, which is salvation from so much more than a fever or a virus. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I'm going to move us to Isaiah uh, 40, partly uh, because uh, the line that always sticks out for me is uh, that third question, has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not heard this story all your life? Don't you know? What have you heard? And before uh, we talk about the specifics of this particular verse, in the context of just hearing the gospel and hearing the good news, whether it's from John or from Mark, of just hearing this promise of God's peace and presence, does it not astound you? Uh, that's how I've always read that question. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? You know, it's a, it's a rhetorical calling to, this is pretty incredible. Are you listening? Do you not remember? And I just want folks to feel that sense of the uh, promise and I'm going to use Matt's words again, the spectacle, as we tell this, as we, as we rehearse this text again. Chapter 40 
um, is not uh, a uh, chronologically immediately after the events of chapter 39. Uh, chapter 40 rehearses what has happened in the midst of the, the being in exile. And it's important to hear this good news in the midst of the worst situation that ancient Israel had found themselves in. And it's at this point that they are, are being called to recognize who God is and the, the uh, greatness of God. I, I, I talk about this uh, in, in using the line is uh, uh, following up that um, the word of God is no candle, blow on because we've kind of lived in a sense where the world has been blowing every bad thing it can at us. And, and is, it gonna, is it gonna blow out our light? And it's like, no, because this good news uh, captivates us. Ralph, as you just described, Caroline speaking, not about the book we know she loves, but about the good news that we all are drawn into. Have you not heard this story? from the very beginning. Yeah, and I and I if you, I think if you went that direction too, Joy, to uh, just direct your attention back to uh, have you not known or have you not heard uh, this announcement of this good tidings, which we get in verse nine, uh, 10 and 11. And so get your get yourself up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings, or is it herald of good tidings to Zion? I'd, I'd let Rolf figure that Hebrew thingamajig out. Uh, but the herald of good tidings, of course, in uh, Greek, in the Septuagint, that's the masculine nominative singular participle of Ewangelizo. So it's the one who brings the good news, the one who shares the good news. And that good news is your God is here. Here's your God. That's the good news. Yes. That's the gospel. And so, uh, so if you're going to go that direction, have you not known, have you not heard, your God is here. That's the promise of second Isaiah, promise to the Israelites um, in, um, in their captivity and the promise to us now. So yeah, that would be that would be the uh, I think a great connection with if you went the direction that you're going, Joy. I uh, I love this. I, I just want you guys to uh, keep talking, but I will throw in a couple things. Uh, one is that um, this is an example. Joy, uh, Joy was talking earlier about the mark about the preaching this astounding news. What does that sound like to preach this? Well, this is what it sounds like. Don't you know? Haven't you heard from the beginning, right? Just the excitement of the prophet here. This is, uh, I think this is an example of this exuberant preaching that Joy was talking about. Uh, that's so lovely. Um, second thing is um, this, this uh, passage is pulled from a longer passage, which is a, a, picks up one of Isaiah's themes um, against worshiping idols or false gods. So it's in a longer passage uh, that is about um, saying, you know, why would you worship, why would you worship a stick? Um, have you seen, or a little, see, have you seen how they make these gods? They take a stick, they shave parts of it and they throw it in the fire and then they worship it into the rest and say, this is God. And so, and then it's got this beautiful line, uh, to whom will you compare me or to what image will you liken me? Fred Geiser, our retired colleague, has a great article called um, To Whom Then Will You Compare Me? It was in Word and World a few years ago. Um, and Because uh, Fred, Fred knew, knows second Isaiah better than anybody I know. And then, then Fred, as he's reading it, uh, noticed that so Isaiah says over and over again throughout second Isaiah, to whom will you compare me? And then if you look at his preaching, He's always comparing God to something. God's a savior, a potter, a rock. God's a warrior. God's a woman in labor. God's a shepherd. God's a friend. God's a helper, a lover, you know, a mother. It's so great that um, there's nothing that can be compared to God, but you can't know God without God comparing God's agency to all these things we know. And I just think that's so awesome. And so many of those images are actually the ones created in the image of God. 
It's, it's what it means to be human. You know, a mother, a lover, it, you know, just a shepherd, you know, whatever our vocation is, it, it's the human one, the one who is formed in the image of God. So uh, I, I, I love that I heard somewhere, uh, and I can't recall who said it, uh, but that the reason that uh, the people of God were told don't make an image of God is because God has chosen to make God's own image and that is humanity. This becomes really interesting then when we go back to Mark 1, that one of the things that's happening to Simon's mother-in-law is the, the imprint of the divine on her is being now restored, right? That her own, um, not to say that those who can't offer service or that those who are ill have lost, uh, the image of God, but there's something that, that reaffirms that in her by restoring her to wholeness uh, as well, at least being delivered from the threat of death, right? If death is the breaking of the divine image in some way, then um, then that too, then all of the magnificence that we've you two have been talking about it, about Isaiah 40 gets realized in this woman whose name we don't know and who, um, right, was left alone to lie in bed with a fever on the Sabbath when others were at the synagogue. And uh, there's a, a, a redignifying and a reasserting of her um, ability to carry the divine image. And I, I think uh, if, if that ends up being part of what your, part of what your sermon wants to do, uh, Psalm 147 gives you language for that. Um, it gives you additional language for talking about that that grandeur and that that divine magnificence and the um, have you not have you not heard uh, have you not seen and so um, that that would be I think to to borrow the language from the psalm and and use that would be ideal. Yeah, I think I think this psalm really does uh, what the what the lectionary attended this psalm originally to do, which is to be a, a liturgical response to the first reading, that it does give, you know, um, praise language. And, and you know, it, you start to read it. And, and if, if you're up on either old hymnody or new praise music, you can just hear so many of those lyrics and lines jumping off uh, from, uh, from this. Uh, I do love the line, he provides food for the cattle and also for the young ravens when they call. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't also mention my retired colleague, Jim Lindbergh, has a uh, article on this, Quoth the Raven, although I can't remember. I think it's in some fresh or somewhere. The young ravens as opposed to the old ravens? Yeah, it's the young ravens. I mean, just you know, can't you picture? So you've got this great grandeur of God. What does he do? He, he numbers the stars and calls them by name. But what else does he do? Those little ravens in their nest when they're hungry. He provides food for them, right? I mean, so you get the you get the uh, magnificent and then the imminent God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty spectacular, right there. Are ravens the, the same as crows? Close enough. Close enough. The, the psalmist ravens. never watched those Planet Earth things with David Attenborough narrating that I watch with my kids. It does give you a different perspective. <laughs> it does. It always is like, oh no. Not the little birds. Get the fox away. Oh yeah. So I'm sorry for the birds. Those well, I'm birds. just thinking. I'm trying to think if if it's a uh, if it's a murder of crows, what is it of ravens? I don't know. I'm not sure. Our uh, our tech wizard Ben, our who, one man who makes everything work, has notified us that Rolf, you're talking about a God so near essays on Old Testament theology in honor of Patrick D. Miller. That's, yes, that's where you'll find that article. I couldn't. Excellent. I thought it was an Efeshrift, and it is. It is. So there you this go. Is... You can buy that. He also <laughs> notified us that we do use the NRSV on Working Preacher. It's just that the four of us are working off of some cut and paste from a different translation. So it's good to know. Just I in case there's any editorial types corrected. out there. This is our last chance in First Corinthians until um, until Lent arrives and and takes it away from us. Mm. And I, I'm I'm going to lean into um, where you were ending off, Ralph, and talking about that, uh, just, just the energy 
of, of, of saying these words, this line, for I am compelled to, to preach. And uh, I, I, I read, I've always read this, this portion of chapter uh, of 1 Corinthians in uh, the sense of uh, a counter, make everybody like me to, for the sake of the gospel, I will enter into your context and just bring, let you know that God is here. So, you know, Paul is saying, you know, to win the Jews, I'll be uh, to the to the Jews, to those under the law, I become like one under the law. But it's not like I'm going to say I'm going to make you like me. It's like this word that I have for you is so important for you to know. I'm going to understand you and bring it to you in your language, in your context, in your reality, so that you can hear that God is with us. Which is so key, I think, well, it's helpful for understanding Paul, but in a, in a passage like this, when we're talking about, again, epiphany, when we're looking at this in perhaps in combination with what's going on in Mark chapter one, what does it look like for this, this announcement of the kingdom of God to be breaking in, whether the time is fulfilled? And in some ways that's Jesus saying, let me do my thing but he's also called followers, right? He's also restored Simon's mother-in-law to a particular position of, 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 of service. Uh, and he's calling us, of course, today. And so what does that look like for the ways in which uh, we, we manage our institutions or you know, perform ministry? And so Paul helps us, I think, think about how do we be careful that we're not saying, I know exactly what your situation is like, you know, the commentary on, on the website helps us avoid doing that, but also says you can't just expect people to learn your language or to follow your traditions um, or to share your values necessarily, the way in which you express those values. You've got to do that translational work that's part of all theology, all ministry. It's, you know, it. it's such a lesson in ministry, whether the ministry is pastoral ministry or any other kind of ministry, teaching ministry, that is, you have to become part of the community. And if you're constantly teaching your flock, no matter what they are, how different you are than them and that you are not one of them, um, your ministry will be less effective. Um, and Part of it is translation, as you've said, learning the language and, and so that you can bring the power of the word of God into whatever the, the, the local word is. And, a, and a, the, the book par excellence on that is Lam and Sana, uh, Lam and Sana uh, translating the message, I think is the name of that book. But, the, uh, but it's also, you know, um, eating the food, you know, knowing, the, uh, you know, being seen in the community um, and, and all of that. I've, I haven't told a story in a while, so I'm going to take advantage and do one uh, because uh, I grew up uh, in uh, um, uh, uh, the middle of the city of Chicago uh, in a uh, African-American context in a church that sang gospel music. Uh, primarily, uh, not not solely, but largely, uh, and uh, um, my first church uh, that I was appointed to as a United Methodist was uh, in a smaller town in Michigan, uh, and um, the um, music director and organist were master's level trained um, musicians in um, classical music. And um, classical music for me was what I listened to when I did a candlelight dinner and invited my boyfriend over. That, so that, that's what classical music conjured up in my imagination. So the first Sunday, I'm sitting on the pulpit and um, they start to do the prelude and the music is conjuring up nothing related to worshiping God for me. And what is going through my mind is, I am so grateful people cannot read my mind right now because I'm going back to a date night. I am not ready for worship. 
And I tell that story because in order to be in that community, that's exactly what I had to learn. I had to learn to worship God through classical music. And, you know, I also had to learn to go to uh, what my second church was uh, in a rural community. I had to learn to worship God with farmers and, and um, uh, w watch lambs being born and totally different than my world uh, that I grew up in. And yet that is one of the things I sometimes say to my students. I hope your first call is so very different from the church where you found, were spiritually formed so that you can learn to love God's people and show them where God is in their world and not convert that context to your world because God isn't just where you were spiritually formed. God is also in the new places where God is calling all of us.